I'm going to ask you all the four questions and you may have to give me responses. Since it's the last day, I think I'm free to do whatever I want. So, the last question is, who is the experiencer? And this is the crux of the heart problem. Right? I'm not going to repeat heart problem again, what is it, but I guess you understood. Uh, I think our friend has missed most, most of this lecture, but uh, welcome. And uh, there's probably a few minutes left, I don't know how much you're going to get from it. But anyway, it's like consciousness, you know, suddenly a new entity comes and you have to again start the story all over again. Uh, in any case, the last question <coughs> in the heart problem consciousness is, who is the experiencer? Who is experiencing it? When we talk about consciousness, we cannot forget that we are talking about a person who is accumulating certain experiences who is getting influenced by these experiences accumulated at this point and over a period of time, diachronically and synchronically. So at any point, you are the person who is experiencing it. After 25 years also, you would relate to a person who would have remembered that experience and therefore would have given some value to that experience. So who is the experiencer here? Can we bring him out? Why is he hiding? I mean, why is she hiding? Or he or she is hiding. Where is she hiding? Or is it a myth? In fact, Thomas Metzinger defines self as a myth. His book, Ego Tunnel, subtitle is The Myth of Self. Well, I really got angry by seeing that subtitle. But then, you know, you cannot express your, your anger except in writing in, in academics. Otherwise, you would have done something else. So, you would say that people like Metzinger would say that self is a myth. But then we don't know. There are very many theories on both sides. Uh, if Metzinger would say self is a myth, for a few others, like uh, Martin Seligman, or uh, Six and Mihaly, and uh, so many other psychologists and philosophers, self is the only thing which is non mythical. Existence. Rest of it is all myth. Because we are all storytellers. Day morning and the, 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 the day begins in the morning, 6 a.m. or for some of us, 11 o'clock, 11 a.m. Whenever it starts, from that time onwards till the night ends, again, whenever the night ends, for some of us, actually, the night ends during the wee hours of the morning. That's another paradox, again. Now, whatever it is, uh, we, we do not know how the self can be explained in terms of an experience. We, we have not found, we have not found the experience, experience as such. We only mix, we only make, we only narrate stories. Stories of our own life, our own going. And the story is not just verbal, just textual, but the way we live is a story. And this is very interesting disciplines are there around this, that, of a narrative mechanism. But in any case, if we have time, we can go into that. But then who is the experiencer is not just a million dollar question, but actually it is multiple billion dollar question. Because as the day passes, this question is getting richer and richer. There are more and more people coming into the fray and saying that, oh, I have an answer, but then only to be attacked the next day by another theory, which either says that this theory is limited or there's a better theory. So who is the experiencer gain? There's a search for, a kind of a detective search for the experiencer only to find that the place you thought he or she is there until that moment is now uh, abandoned. And then you have to all again start a new search. In fact, that's why consciousness studies is so important. That uh, when you think that you have got a little grasp of this mystical person or this mystical entity, then you only find very soon that actually your whole theory has gone wrong. So, People working in consciousness studies is, is uh, better rewarded, are, are better rewarded if they are open-minded and do not care if their pet theories are dismissed very soon. Now, uh, I have a, a few more minutes and uh, in those minutes I want to share with you another idea which is, which is distinct, making a distinction between physicality and subjectivity of consciousness. 
So let me come back to you on, uh, uh, on a phenomenon or an expression which I made in the beginning, or I don't know, if, if I don't remember if I uh, used that, which is the binding problem of consciousness. How does the different neural processes, physical processes, quantitative processes, bind together? Did I say that in the beginning? So how do they bind together to give rise to something which is subjective? How does the neural, neural processes bind together to give rise to something which is subjective? So this is called as the binding problem. It mainly means, you know, how does a few things get together and make a grand uh, game out of it? Something like that. So but what is interesting is, in binding problem of consciousness, uh, we saw that there are two kinds of issues. One is the issues which are settled by solving the easy problems and the other is the hard problem. So basically the easy problems relate to how do we understand the sense of body, our bodily sense. Because it relates to the physical processes, neural processes and so on. And the hard problem is the self sense. How do we understand the sense of self? So, if we can put it in a different manner of language, easy problem is the problem of understanding the body and the bodily sense, and hard problem is to understand the self sense. Now, uh, I, I wish to share with you a few more ideas on this, and I try to make it as simple as possible so that all of us understand it. Many of you would have heard or many of you would have read, perhaps, the astonishing hypothesis of Francis Crick, right? Francis Crick, astonishing hypothesis. And uh, there is a much uh, a very popular, popular text, a popular portion of text in that book, which is often referred and quoted by scholars, either to in support or in criticism. Let me read this to you. You, you in double quote, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. As Louis Carroll, Alice might have phrased it, you are nothing but a pack of neurons. Many were inspired by this. Oh, finally, we have to only search for a pack of neurons that would tell us about the you. The you is the main uh, fascinating uh, term which he uses in double quote, which means the I or the self. Uh, many people were interested in this astonishing hypothesis. A few got astonished, and for a few the astonishment only stayed for a while. They again got back to the same old problem, again the riddles, puzzles continuing. Now, let's give attention to the word used here in double quote. I'm not able to show you, but you with a capital Y and a double quote. For Crick, you is a non-entity. Why? Because it is no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells. And therefore, it is not sufficient to talk about a concept of self. And interestingly, if you remember the subtitle of his book, is called the scientific search for the soul. You see two elements on the two ends of that phrase. Scientific, a very you know, respected uh, framework, and soul, poor old soul, nobody to support, no one has seen it. People only uh, speculate about it. And even if someone says they have a soul or they have experienced soul, you feel that it's a very nice story and entertainment. So I feel that Crick has very intelligently or very sarcastically put this scientific search for soul. Does that mean that he is searching for a soul? No. It means that there is nothing called a soul or what you are trying to explain or understand as self is nothing but soul, which is non-existent. And uh, therefore for Crick, the search for self is absolutely irrelevant because the soul is non-existent. Now, many years have passed, Crick published this astonishing hypothesis. 
Today, the idea of self is one of the most important problems for neuroscience, neuropsychiatry, and neuropsychology. One of the uh, latest handbooks I saw, 2010, published by Oxford, Oxford Handbook of the Self. I thought even the title is so nice. Because a few years back, nobody would think of a handbook of self. Because self is not something so neat. You can produce a handbook out of it. So, uh, so there's a lot of renewed interest in self. And it's also because other disciplines have come into it, particularly not only just neurosciences, but neuropsychiatry and neuropsychology. And uh, earlier it was more a philosophical game, but today it's no more just a philosophical muddle for the neurosciences. They take it, take it very seriously. In fact, even if they admit or not, neurosciences find self as the major problem to be dismissed or to be explained in order to understand human experiences. Now, what exactly is the nature of such a puzzle which was dismissed by Frick? The fundamental problem is, please listen carefully because this may get slightly technical but I think it's easy to understand. The fundamental problem is the question, is my inner awareness of myself separate from my body? Is my inner awareness of myself, is it separate from my body? Or is it deeply connected with the body that without the body I can't or I, I will never understand or experience a self? Now there are at least three levels of awareness implicit in questions like this. But uh, if we boil down into just two preliminary minimalistic issues, these issues are what are body sense and self sense? Because time has come now that we just no more talk about just the heart problem or just the uh, subjectivity of consciousness. The heart problem and subjectivity of consciousness is discussed in the context of body embodiment and a self sense which inheres or which directs the body sense. One of the most interesting portrayal of self in recent times has been that of Dennett, Daniel Dennett. He separates self from body with certainty, very sure. Some of these philosophers are very sure about things which they do. So very sure that self is separate from the body. But then he gets into a different ball game altogether. He equates <coughs> self with a narrative fiction and hope. Self is a narrative fiction. Very nice, right? To hear that it's a story which we all make. Self is a story which we make. And who is listening? We are listening. And who is being influenced by story? We are influenced. So I make my story, I listen to my story, and I'm influenced by story. It's a very interesting position, but very hard to believe that all these things happen in one in just one point. So for Dennett, there is no minimal or embodied self. There's no self which is embodied. But there is only a self which is created in one's own uh, biographical fiction. So we write our own biographies and then that's the story of the self. A, 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 a particular reference from him, since this is interesting, according to Dennett, a self, according to my theory, is not only not any old mathematical point, but an abstraction defined by the myriad of attributions and interpretations that have composed the biography of the living body whose center of narrative gravity it is. As such, it plays a singularly important role in the ongoing cognitive economy of that living body. Because of all the things in the environment, an active body must make mental models of None is more, more crucial than the model that the agent has of itself. Well, uh, Metzinger also considers that the self-sense is actually the representation, all the representation of processes in our brain. So it's a meta-representation, and that way it is unique to human brains. Now, if we can see that there is something called self-sense, and that it is separate from the body's sense, Further, there will be other questions. Now, what are these questions? So if we imagine that the self-sense and the body-sense are two different entities, they are on, on 
well, I shouldn't say ontological, that would be too much of a jargon. They are two different beings, then there are several questions which are going to come up. What are these questions? Are these two distinct senses completely distinct? Are their boundaries very nicely framed and separated, segregated? If not, how are they entangled? What is the nature of entanglement of the body sense and self sense? Because our experience is always experience of them as together, right? Most of our experiences. Of course, there are experiences we may uh, separately see them, but then in given experience, day to day life experience, the body sense and self sense come together, right? Isn't it? Only in few cases, sometimes you know, you are feeling you are having to, to give an example. Uh, you are very tired at the end of the day, but then the following day you have to submit your um, assignment. Your body is very weak. Your body tells you, no, you should be sleeping now, or you should be doing something else, or you should be, you know, just keeping quiet. But then. Something else in you says that, no, 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 even if my body is not ready to do this, I have to submit my assignment tomorrow because if I don't, the consequences of it is going to affect me both physically and mentally. So why I made this example is that even the distinction of body sense and self sense which we make in our daily life is very subliminal. We don't even realize that. And that's why uh, we talk about levels of reflection. We all are able to reflect. We all reflect. Not, not just able, we reflect. Even when we are listening to something, we are reflecting. Right? But then the levels and degrees of reflection change from person to person, from his or her, according to his or her background. <coughs> now, so the question is, if these are separate, or if they are not separate, how are they entangled since I experience them together? And the, uh, perhaps the most interesting question for all of us is what constitutes these basic everyday senses? Can we actually talk about it a little more concretely? What is the basic what are the basic constituents of the body sense and the self sense? I may not have enough time to discuss about it, but I'll take a few more minutes to talk to you about what exactly do we mean by sense? What exactly do we mean by body sense? What exactly do we mean by self sense? Because at this point, I'm going to uh, assume that these three can be explained or clarified in a distinct manner. We have vocabulary, we have experiments, we have theories to see that these three can be distinctly understood. Even if you may not believe in the distinct existence of these three as completely different. Now, first, what exactly do we mean by sense? Because we, there are lots of, many, many words which uses the word sense, right? Do you remember Aristotle's common sense? Again, in Indian philosophy also, there are very many ideas which relate to that common sense. Common sense. And making sense of something. You know, you said that, oh, I really think, I couldn't make any sense of what was happening. Right? You, you said, what do you mean by that? The word sense, in general, in regular parlance, day-to-day -day parlance, imply, implies a meaning intended or conveyed. It means a meaning which is intended or conveyed. For example, we may say, what you say makes sense to me, which means I understand, I agree with you. Another idea of the sense is to be aware or to have clear thinking to be clear. For example, we may say, finally he came to his senses. He realized something is wrong. You know, now he has come to his senses. The third possibility of sense is a vague or little awareness. For example, you may say, I get a sense that something is not okay. Which means, I'm not very sure whether that thing is not okay, but at least I think that something is wrong. So I get a sense. So he has a vague awareness. Well, there's another set of meanings which are more kind of technical attributes for the word sense, which are the faculty to perceive, like sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. And it could also imply the ability to move and 
assess posture, which is technically called as proprioceptive sense. And finally, it could also mean something which is very fundamental and close, like the feeling of I am. Now, let's come back to this question once again. Are the self sense and body sense completely distinct? A dominant reductionist approach inspired by Aristotelian thinking is that self sense is the body sense. Who I am, who I am, is closely tied to my embodied existence. Why? I cannot sense myself without the accompanying body sense. You cannot touch yourself, you cannot feel yourself without your body, without your body sense. Another view, perhaps more of an idealist intent, is that self-sense is not just a sense, but the essence. Though they sound similar, they're completely two different worlds. So self-sense is not just one another sense, but it is the essence. This essence can be very minimal, something which can be simulated in a mechanistic uh, equipment, or it could be something so deep, like the pure consciousness, which we don't understand, which, talk, which is talked about by Eastern tradition and some of the Western traditions. Now, uh, once we come to the body sense, or when, once we come to see them uh, distinctly, the view is that embodiment is only one aspect of the self sense. Now, such a view is not new and commenced from the time of Upanishads in the East, Pythagoras in the West, later developed by Plato, Augustine, and Descartes. Now, the extreme view to all this is that the sense of self is actually non existent. There is not even an attempt to metaphorically uh, describe it, but the nihilist approach of dismissing it outrightly. And uh, the vociferous champion of this view and my favorite philosopher for his clear thinking because of such a reductive pattern is Thomas Metzinger. He equates the sense of self not with anything else, yet another phenomenal experience just as smell or taste. Just as you have smells and tastes every day, self is just another sense. I mean, it's, 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 I mean for some of us it is, it is outrightly unacceptable. You know, how can your self-sense be something like any other uh, qualia or any other qualitative experiences like taste or smell? You have taste and smell because of the self. I never know what is the taste of my self. Um, uh, myself. In fact, um, there's another philosopher who wrote about that I just don't know how the self tastes like. I know the taste of many other things, but I don't know how the self tastes like. But anyway, Metzinger likes to use uh, these phenomenal qualities to describe self. I'll just read perhaps uh, two lines from him just to give you a sense of what he means. What exactly does it mean to have the conscious experience of being someone? In this limited sense, the folk phenomenological notion of being someone denotes a phenomenal property like many others, a property like the scent of mixed amber and sandalwood, or the gustatory experience of cinnamon, a property like the emotional experience of elation, or the sense of surprise going along with a sudden cognitive insight. Now, an immediately noticeable mistake that Metzinger makes is to club self-sense in the category of percepts and sensory fields. People who are trained in philosophy would be able to appreciate this. If the self sense is another field, then how and why is that this grand field persists and continues to hold and showcase all other fields is a very important question. <clears throat> Moreover, though it is empirically easier to conceptualize embodiment and self sense as one, experientially it is otherwise. To understand our identity with body parts and body as a whole, to recognize the illusoriness and reality of that body or body parts which we own as ours. I'm referring to an experiment of the uh, rubber hand illusion. Some of you are familiar with that. And this is to relate the representation of the body and its staging contours 
require the distinction between the body sense, the self sense, and what I would like to describe as a core self, <coughs> the most essential, or uh, deepest aspect of self, which is the core self. I will spend, take a few more minutes um, to, to share a few more ideas about what is body sense. I may not have time to go into what is self sense, but let's at least say what is body sense, because at least that is what we have to take care of every day and night, carry with us, right? Morning till evening. So let us see what is this body which we carry with us. All of you would have some idea of what is body sense. What is that feeling or sense of body? I mean, for example, for instance, many of you would now be having a desire to sip a hot cup of steaming, uh, a steaming hot cup of coffee or tea. It's 10.30, 10.35. This lecture has started at 9.30, <coughs> you know. So you feel that a hot, nice, steaming cup of tea will be a bad idea. Our body sense is always acknowledged in terms of certain internal senses, such as, I mean, I'll come back to the case part a little later, such as pain, right? If you have a headache, I don't have to tell you what, how, how closely you feel your body, right? Because even your ability to be attentive is influenced by the, by headache, and all of us have headaches, right? I'm not saying in a metaphorical sense, because you can be a headache for somebody else, and someone can be a headache for you, not in that sense, but the real, actual ache, which happens on this part of your head. And in fact, headaches also can be, I just read that an article, it talks about different kinds of headache. It was very interesting that how pain itself is nuanced, is nuanced, is seen in a nuanced fashion. But anyway, let us go, I'm not going to do that. But, uh, so what I was trying to tell you is that body sense is basically a combination of internal senses such as pain, balance. See, all of you are able to sit in your chair without falling. And, or I'm able to stand here without falling. I may fall, I don't know, but at least at this point I think I'm not going to fall. And many of you are very comfortably seated in the chair. I don't know how comfortable these seats are. They look to be very comfortable. You're comfortable and you're not falling. At least I didn't see anyone falling, even in the real self. I didn't see anyone sleeping at least. So you can fall in very many ways. I mean, you can fall if you're sleeping. Or you can fall if your balance is lost. The balance is the major constituent of the bodily sense, which, uh, <clears throat> which is technically called as the proprioceptive sense, because it, it, it allows you to know the relation between your body parts and the pressure and uh, the effort you need to give to lift an object, all of this is subsumed under this very interesting uh, aspect of our body called this proprioceptive sense. And we also have inner senses as thirst and anger. As I told you, you, know, you decide to have a hot cup of coffee, a nice clean cup, steaming, nice coffee or nice tea, that would be a good idea. So you also have, you know that of oh, my body, Sometimes we even make expression, I think my body needs a cup of coffee now. You don't say, I need a cup of coffee. You say, my body needs a cup of coffee, right? Such an expression is there. Which means, my, I feel my body is tired or my body needs, needs to have a kick. In any case, so these four, pain, balance, thirst, hunger, kind of inner senses. We experience different kinds of pain, as I told you, from a pink prick to much intense toothaches. Again, if you write a terminology of toothache, that itself is very interesting. You know, how nuanced a toothache is. is. <coughs> your toothache will be very, very different from your friend's toothache, though both are clubbed under the category of toothache. That means, even when we talk about a generalistic idea of these senses which are available to all of us, the unique experience of that by each of us as individuals, unique individuals, is very different, right? Otherwise, we, I mean, a, a, a toothache can be just one experience, no. In fact, uh, uh, you know, I hear people describing about toothache in a very different manner. So you would say, are they talking about the same thing? At least a tooth has to be there to be a toothache. Perhaps that is the commonest thing, but the ache itself can be so nuanced that you cannot just club under uh, one, you know, one way of describing it. Just, just to tell you that 
even when we say our body is a combination of several inner senses, the nuances can be so different. But this is just a, you know, just to make it a little comfortable, just to make it easy, we are saying that the body is made of these senses. Uh, apart from this, there is something called as uh, body maps in the brain, which again contributes to the representation of the various complex processes which go behind our cognitive and emotional uh, experiences. The body sense is, uh, first of all, something which we have intuitively. We don't have to work hard for it. It is, I mean, in normal conditions, it is something which is available to us. And uh, the neurological theory behind this, behind this uh, idea is that there are body maps in the brain and, uh, for example, there are discussions on mirror neurons, which again is a kind of mapping, and uh, with the help of the me and the other divide. And uh, there is another sense which is called as the peripersonal space. Peripersonal space is very interesting. Uh, in that, it is not purely biological, but then you cannot dismiss it. Very personal space is that space which extends to the tip of my arm's length. Or if you are holding a particular equipment or a tool that ends, that stands to the end of it. A space which we carry around. And uh, it could be of cultural origin, but biologically motivated, but of cultural origin. But there is always a space. That's why sometimes if unknown people comes very close to almost to the tip of your nose, <coughs> this guy is he going to attack me. There's always a safe distance between you and the other person. Whenever that safe distance is crossed, you feel that your security is violated. Very personal space is a mechanism in the brain to tell us when you are in danger and when you are okay. Now, as I told you, there are also biological motivations behind the body maps in the brain. And the first of such a body map in the brain was uh, uh, plotted by uh, a person, a neurologist called Penfield, and is famously called as Penfield's homunculus. He, he describes a stretch of cortical area representing your whole body, certain parts of that of cortical area having more space for certain organs and certain organs then represented in little space. Now, Apart from this, there are different kinds of topographic maps of the body stored in the brain cortex. They are altered and updated according to newer experiences and changing environment. And what is interesting here is the play between biology and daily living. That our experiences change the brain maps. They are not just sedentary and defined forever. The brain, our experiences change the brain maps. And with reorganized brain maps, our experiences also alter. Uh, I think I, I, we have to leave time for questions, right? Okay, I think I have already already time. Well, well, what I wanted to share with you is that you can approach a body sense in a very from a very biological context, understand body sense to be constituted by various biological mechanisms which are also influenced by our cultural, social, psychological lives. But then once we come to the self-sense, then more attention is needed, which I guess I may not be able to do it today, maybe another opportunity. Self-sense is something which is not easily uh, available for biology to understand. And that is why, in many of these theories, whenever you talk, we, we have to come to theorize self-sense. Either it is spoken in terms of a phenomenology or in terms of an embodiment. Embodiment is the closest concept which is now available to, uh, to integrate the self-sense with the body sense. But then, at least according to me, there are problems with that kind of a combining because the body sense cannot be <coughs> the seed of both bodily attributes and a sense which transcends the body. So there has to be something else with which we are able to understand and manipulate the body sense better. Friends, what I wanted to share with you this morning is 
not much, but just to give you a bird's eye view that the field of consciousness, which perhaps started in ancient times, both in India and Greece and Egypt or other ancient civilizations, looking at the seat of consciousness in the heart or in the brain, because you know, many people thought that consciousness is actually seated, seated in the brain or in the brain, of course, today we think, but also it was thought of as being seated in the heart. But from such a postulation, today we have traveled quite a bit. There are a few theories which have, which are, which have consistently uh, have been annoying, annoying to us or inspiring to us, particularly the theories which talk about the self-sense, because it is a concept which is much old, older. But the concept of body sense is also actually older, or older if you look at medical history. But today what has made consciousness interesting is that we can talk about a phenomenon which is complex. At the same time, we can talk about in some clear fashion what are the constituents of this phenomenon. If at all we can take the such a view. And body and embodiment are two very interesting concepts to understand consciousness. Thank you. Yes, Manish. Uh, thanks for that talk. I was planning to ask a question to try and make connections between the discipline of uh, consciousness studies and the various aspects of it and how they connect to the various aspects of uh, cognitive science. But you kind of covered that as you spoke in a very interesting uh, section when you spoke about the policy of the word sense and how we have these various connotations of sense in that you use sense to refer to uh, things that we perceive, we use sense to refer to things that we comprehend, we use sense to refer to semantic perception in that we make sense of language and so on. Uh, so could you speak a little bit more about how while consciousness studies is a venerable millennia old discipline and cognitive science is uh, not even half a century old, roughly the same question.